target questions. What is the right bibliographic format for name your favorite source in sketch writing? No. Uh, ah, my favorite. Isabel, I'm teaching a class now. Can I call you back after class? Um, and then I'm having lunch with Ignacio. Um, can we talk tomorrow, maybe? In two hours, I can talk for a short bit, yes. Okay, bye. Those of you going to Spain, this is gonna be your favorite teacher. Isabel Sanchez, she's amazing. She thought we were supposed to talk this morning. Okay. All right, what was I saying? What are your target questions? Like you can have to do with the sketch writing that you were so frustrated with and you wanna succeed, but you can't succeed, but you need to succeed. It could be about sketch writing. Any questions about the sketch writing? The goal is for the sketch writing to become so normal and natural to your habit of mind, to your habit that it's just your go-to pro move when you're facing uh, the challenge of understanding something that's complex and lots of things to look at and read, but you don't have enough time. This is what you do, sketch writing. It should become normal and natural. What questions do you have that would help it become normal and natural? How close are we to me just looking through the Google Doc saying, yep, you got it. And then everybody just gets 12 out of 12 points every week. Boom, 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 which is the goal, right? What's standing in the way of that? What questions do you have? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between real citations and Okay. Other questions. We're just collecting questions. So that that's the only question anyone has that's keeping you from just it's keeping us from just doing it as a matter of habit. Everybody gets 12 out of 12 points, and we move on to something. It's meaningful about the content of the course. That's the only question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just add a question. Why do we put page locations? Why do we, do we really, do we really need to put page locations? Why do we need to do that? Um, okay. Now, how about the analysis? Yes. So it's like, like, or yeah, captioning. The caption. What about this caption? What's your question about the caption? It's like what it is. What is the caption? Is that a good question? How to do the caption successfully? Common mistakes, okay. Those are good. Any other questions about the analysis? Yeah. Um, we had talked about in a previous class if we were going to be able to redo them. Yes. Them. Um, my favorite answer to that is yes, please redo your analysis before I sit down on. Uh, 
Wednesday morning to evaluate them. If you, if you turned in your analysis relatively complete and on time, then please redo it based on your new understanding after class on Tuesday before Wednesday morning. So you got a 24 hour window. If you turn it in on time on Tuesday, then you have the opportunity to redo it, turn it in uh, within 24 hours after that first deadline. And it won't be counted late. As long as you turned in a relatively complete version on Tuesday morning, does that make sense? But will they, I think the question was after they've been graded, if you got feedback and we kind of understand like what you were looking more for. Yes. Are we able to redo it then? Okay, if you want, so that's the first deal. There's a, we're opening the window. Does that make sense? But you know, what we don't want to happen is like, oh, I can just throw some crap in because I don't have time. I'll throw some crap in by 7 a.m. on Tuesday and then I'll redo it. The real deadline is 24 hours later. No, it is not. You have to do a real live, substantial, com substantially complete effort in time for the deadline of 7 a.m. Tuesday morning in order to qualify for this special deal of redoing it in time for uh, 24 hours later. Then after that, I will uh, accept redos. But in order to not make this a whole thing, this is the common practice uh, of people who seem to know what they're doing, is uh, let's say you get uh, an 18 out of 24 on the first attempt. Not bad, B. But you're not happy with the B, right? Who's happy with the B? I want an A. So you redo it and you do it, you redo it after you get the grade and the feedback. And now you score a 22 out of 24. Your final grade, this is not your new grade. What your new grade is, is halfway between those two, which some would say is 20 out of 24. So we average the first attempt and the second attempt. Does that make sense? Is that it's because uh, it's it's part of it's there's a long history to this that uh, has been explained to me but I'm not sure I can explain. Yes, sir. When you want the like redone analysis, like redone. Any time you want before the end of the semester. How about that? But if we do it before the Wednesday, or is it still the half like average? No. Okay. If you do it in time, if you do it within 24 hours of the original deadline as a second substantial attempt, that's your grade. I'll grade the second one, not the first one. Okay. okay. Does that sound good? You like that? Okay. Okay. Now you did all this reading. You read, you read, uh, Mike Davis's City of Ports, groundbreaking work of uh, critical, critical uh, critique of urban form and policy, Frank Gehry, policing social forces in Los Angeles, which is the basis for the title of this week's topic, which is called the LA School. And we'll talk about what the LA School is there was a an explosion of literature about life in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, with particular attention to the built environment, the form that Los Angeles has evolved over the years, and the policies, the institutional arrangements uh, that are associated with the built environment forms, the LA School, and that's the foundation of this week's topic. So that's kind of the first piece of writing. The next piece of writing in 2017, Richard Rothstein kind of shook the world of architecture 
to its core by publishing The Color of Law. And this kind of came in the aftermath of the uh, Supreme Court judgment that racism in the United States was a matter of personal behavior. Racism in the United States was not a matter of legal structures. The Supreme Court said that. In response, they, and the implication was, if there were legal structures in place that uh, were racist uh, in intent and impact, then the US government overseeing those laws, the governments overseeing those laws would be liable to prosecution. They could be sued and damages could be awarded to the victims of that, those systems of racism. The Supreme Court found, no, it wasn't systemic. There was no legal structure of racism and discrimination. So governments are off the hook. Well, in 2017, Richard Rothstein published this book. And it was like, what? He makes the point that yes, these are legal structures. These are institutional arrangements that resulted in a profound shifting and sorting of personal wealth, among other things, through uh, largely real estate, housing, the thing we were talking about all the time in this class. And then uh, the Thomas article that some of you read, because uh, not everyone read it, uh, the Thomas article was about a few cities, a few towns in the state of Connecticut and their battle. How have these towns been so successful at defeating one effort after another from building affordable housing in these fancy towns? Amazing. Up to the present day. How are they able to do it? Amazing. Right. Okay, so that's those are the readings. Out of the sketch writing, out of your experience of these readings, what are your target questions? What questions are burning? What questions do we need the answers to? Here's a hint. It was part of the sketch writing assignment, your submission to Brightspace. If you follow the instructions, you already thought about this and you already composed a target question and you have it written even though it's early in the morning still for younger minds, it feels like it's early in the morning. You already pre-thought this out. You already pre-wrote it. So let's, let's hear some of them. Right. You mean, has the land value been decreased? Which thing did you read? Okay. If it decreases the value of the land, isn't that a bad thing? Yeah, so what thing is the least all the structure value or all the structure of the street to, um, to gentrify the land? So I'm wondering if um, because the historical value is Okay, value of the land. I mean, it's okay if it goes up, right? But if it goes down, we don't like that as developers from the developers. Keeping the historical connection is more valuable. Right. Yeah, isn't there greater value in maintaining historical connection? Okay, other target questions. Does the militarization and architectural policing of the fiscal socioeconomic boundaries in post liberal Los Angeles further isolate and entrap the lower class individuals, causing them to continue to idle in their current situation? Well, I think you know the answer. Well, yes, but it's also like there's ways around it. How about this? Does the militarization of space, we know it hurts the people. Uh, locked in South Central LA. Does it hurt the fancy people living up in the Hollywood Hills? Well, that's what I was saying. So it kind of like drops them. I guess my question was more meaning for like what's going to be to keep both happy because that's, that's kind of. 
uh -huh. what I have in my um, question from my card. Um, does militarization of space harm the wealthy? I think is that's the that's the starting point for architecture that helps everybody. It's a win -win, right? I like that question. Other target questions? Yes. What kind of investments can be made by the wealthy in these like urban landscapes that, that have been all classes rather than just the wealthy? It's a good one. Other target questions? Target questions. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, how can the city incentivize the flow of money to places other than the Incentivize? Well, the cities kind of just decide, right? Uh, so, I mean, in the reading, they're talking about how like, people lobby to create funds. Yeah. Okay. What are the reasons to shift funding from militarization? to something else. This one's from my name, but I feel like this is a good for Okay. Um, so how can the city of Los Angeles begin to incorporate non-governmental regulated slash enforced shared public spaces in order to begin to reintegrate the potential social use? Um, what type of spaces? So they um the reading was talking about how a lot of these spaces they have like heavy kind of police police yeah. enforced. So it's like spaces that don't have that. So it's kind of taking that right. barrier. Away. What's the alternative to heavy policing? Wait, wait, wait. The, my email feed tells, sends me stories every week of community self policing efforts. And it works. Especially when you give badges to women from the community, they are the mothers and they set these young people straight. And they don't use guns and they know them, and they know their families. And it's way more effective than policing. So I just answered that one, I think. Self-policing. Well, it's like incorporating the shared public spaces. And right now, all that public space is getting taken away. So it's yeah. kind of like you have to end up reshaping some of this new urban structure. Well, the reason we, we the powerful elite of the city of Los Angeles, take away is because it's a hazard. It's a liability to have this public space. It just attracts trouble. And if we can self-police, if there are self-policing strategies and other strategies. I thought it was just more because it makes the neighborhood look better, almost in a way like people will pay more if they feel safer. Also true, yes. Also, if you make it fancy, you know, if you gentrify the area, then- Eco gentrification. Eco gentrification is a strategy that people, that architects deliberately uh, pursue because what are the options? So if you're if you're not an architect, right? If if you're not an architect, we it would, it's understandable that you think that the only choice is allowing crime to sweep through a neighborhood or gentrification. Those are the only two options. But if you are an architect and you are paying attention, there's a whole world of possibilities that involve infrastructure improvements that don't displace people, social arrangements like self-policing that don't displace people and improves the quality of life in the neighborhood. If you're not an architect and you're not paying attention to these solutions, then you think mistakenly that the choices are between decay and decline or gentrification. And those are the only two options. Thankfully, 
that is not at all true. It's increasingly not true. Other target questions? Okay. Um, what's the difference between a note and a bibliography? Well, um, let's see. Let's find. Are we 08 or 07? We're 07. Let's look at the sketch writing. What do your classmates say is the difference? Okay, can everyone see that? So the bibliography is a list of sources that goes at the end of your paper, the end of your book, the end of your chapter. Uh, this book doesn't have it. But the bibliography, here are the sources. It's a list, it's an alphabetized list of sources. That's the first hint. It's a list and it's alphabetized. Is it alphabetized by the first name of the author? No, that wouldn't make any sense. What, what is it alphabetized by? the last name of the first author. So in the bibliography, it's Rothstein Richard, period. Each item in the bibliography listing is separated from everything else with a period. So the author or authors, last name first, first name last, period. The citation, totally different. Citation looks more like a sentence. There's no period in the citation until you get to the very end. Thank you, everyone. You did this mostly right. It's not completely right. Don't get too excited. The next item in a bibliography is the title. If it's the title of a of a article, uh, it's in or a, uh, a chapter then it's in parentheses. This, why? It's just the convention. Why is the plural of ox, oxen and not oxes? It's just the way it is, right? So the title of books and periodicals, what's a periodical? Journals, magazines, newspapers appear periodically. They are all called periodicals. Titles of periodicals and books are italicized. This is the number one way to lose points, is forgetting this rule. What's italicized? Why do we italicize it? I just said it, there's a hint. Armina knows, just tell us. because it's the name of a book. What else do we italicize? Names of periodicals. The New York Times, The Atlantic, those are periodicals. We italicize books and periodicals. What do we italicize? Thank you, Caleb. Points for Caleb. Everyone say it. What do we italicize? Books and periodicals. What was that? Books and periodicals. Other things we put in quotation marks. Why? It's just the rules. I don't, I didn't make the rules. I don't agree with the rules. I think aesthetically it's all wrong. It doesn't make sense because I'm a designer and I'm supposed to think critically. But it's the rules. And I'm, I've been sworn in by the powers that be to enforce the rules. 
What's wrong with this note citation? What's wrong with this note citation? This part is okay, why? This part is not okay, why? You're supposed to italicize what? Books and periodicals. So someone's gonna do that? You have it open? Someone's gonna fix that? Don't make me fix it. You fix it. Thank you, Rob. Okay. In the bibliography, at the end of the work, at the end of your paper, at the end of the book, it uh, is saying, this is just the book I looked at. It doesn't say what page you looked at. It says, this is the book I looked at. Boom, there's no page number. If it's an article in a journal, which is a periodical, uh, then you put the page range from the start to the finish of the article. So sometimes if it's a book, there's no page range. But sometimes if it's a journal article, there's a page range. Unless it's an internet source, in which case we don't have pages and we're still trying to figure out what to do. Questions about that? The facts of publication in a bibliography look like this. What's the place of publication? We want a city. You don't have to say New York. New York, you know where New York is. It's in New York. You don't have to say Paris, France, but if it's Paris, Texas, you do have to say Paris, Texas. If you say Montpellier, that's in France, but if you say Montpelier, that's in Vermont, right? So sometimes you have to put a bigger place, but usually you don't. There are no publishers in Montpelier, so don't worry about it. But when we get to the note citation, we put it in parentheses. Why? That's the standard. But also we're treating the note citation as if it's a sentence. Author, comma. Title of the book, italicized. Thank you, Rob. Facts of publication in parentheses, comma, page range. Why do we need a page range? The ideas that I'm footnoting here uh, in my sketch writing and in my analysis, because that's one of the common mistakes. So I'm answering this one and this one. This is where the idea came from. You want to check, I'm, I'm putting a footnote in my analysis because I'm providing information that uh, since 1973, uh, corporations have diverted more and more of their uh, profits to bought stock buybacks, and part of the investment has impacted housing, et cetera. That's on page 39 of this article by Paul Krug in the New York Times. Right. So I'm I'm saying I'm saying something in my analysis, and a skeptical reader is like, oh, that can't be true. And so what do they do? They look at the footnote and they look it up to see if I'm misinterpreting the source, right? And that's what friends do for each other. They either confirm or correct the interpretation because there's a trail of breadcrumbs that leads back to the original source. Same thing with the image. So th this leads us to this, why? would we need all these page locations, right? Why do we need these page locations? Because someday very soon, someday very soon, we might need to refer to this. And when we need to refer to this, when we need to refer to Benjamin Tillman uh, and uh, the operations of uh, the segregationists in the South uh, and its impact on housing discrimination, 
it's useful if we don't have to find our copy of Richard Rothstein's book and figure out what page that was on. We already said, this is an important thing. Write it down, we might need it later. And by the way, when you go to cite it, you can cite it as an idea that appears on page 41. And we're citing it using a footnote. Are we citing it using a bibliography? No, that's not what we use bibliographies for. We cite the idea with the page location using a footnote. That's what you're doing in the analysis. So you're getting ready for that uh, by making note of page numbers. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Can I, am I allowed, here's a question. I'm just adding another question to this one. Am I allowed in my analysis to use information and footnote and cite information that was in the reading that week? What do you think the answer is? The answer is yes. We love that. It's an enthusiastic yes. The idea of having you read these things is that this is what me and my tribe of college professors all over the world scrambling and struggling to keep up with the unfolding landscape of new understandings of history. We're scrambling to keep up with what's available. And these are the three readings that we think you will find most useful in the practice of architecture moving forward. And we love it when you prove us right by using these things as your footnote citations for the interpretation of the images that you are analyzing. See how it all works together? Okay, is that good? That's why we put page locations. And ideally, you have an idea, you capture it in one or hopefully one sentence, but maybe two, as you have here. But then you have a separate idea uh, and you put it as a separate block of text because you're trying to make a quick list of key ideas that we access. Uh, if, um, you know, maybe that should be bolded. That because it's a key term, sharecroppers, I suggest that be bolded. Um, the key ideas are highlighted that the idea, you identify this as a key idea that is a candidate for weaving into your one sentence takeaway. So key ideas are highlighted, key terms like sharecropper are in bold. It's different than key ideas. There are key terms, sharecropper, there are key ideas, um, biracial state governments was opposed and voters were encouraged, white voters were encouraged to defeat uh, candidates in those elections. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Caption. First of all, are there lots of different ways to do a caption? Yes, there are lots of different ways to do a caption. Um, this, these instructions are based on our best understanding of current practices in architectural publication. If you go back to a book that was published in 2006, it's very different. This does not follow current recommended standards. Um, for reasons I prefer not to go into, I've actually had to spend countless hours working with representatives from the Library of Congress on certain issues about how to track uh, intellectual property rights in compliance with the 1992 copyright laws. Uh, and this is the outcome of that research. Uh, and it's confirmed by current publication practices in the discipline of architecture. This is what we do for captions. 
different, you know, this may still evolve and change, but right now this is our best guide to how to do it. And it's right there. Where, where have I seen this before? Where have you seen this? Is this available to you? Anyone? Anyone, have you ever seen this before? This, this document, where, what is this document? What are we looking at? Have you seen it? Don't be shy. Spawn, you've seen this before, right? You've all seen this before. This is the analysis assignment. When you have a question and your buddy is not right there and your battery's dead on your phone, you could just go back to the assignment instructions and read them. Uh, I know it's way down on page three, but wow, if there are points at stake, it might be worth going all the way down to page three and looking at these instructions. The feedback you often get in response to the analysis is please review the analysis instructions and examples and consider all eight elements of a correct and complete caption. Here are all eight elements of a complete and correct caption. The first one is the hardest one. You take the key insight of the image evidence as you work with it through your paragraph and as you summarize and capture it in your claim. The claim is a sentence. It's a proper sentence. But now, once you've written your claim, now we'll capture that same idea in a short phrase. It's not a sentence. It's just a fragment. Mixed use inclusive arrangements that draw the public in. That's not a sentence. It's shorter than a sentence. It's not the claim. It's shorter than the claim. But it captures the key idea of the claim by combining public library with affordable housing and Taylor Street apartments and the new branch is defining how mixed use architecture can achieve these outcomes, right? So this is a tighter encapsulation. That's the first element. The second element, type of view. The third element, year, the most significant year which is probably the year of conception or the year of opening. The name of the project, the location, the place, you don't have to say Chicago, Illinois. We know where Chicago is. Uh, the creator, if it's known, because you could be looking at something that has an anonymous creator, and the patron, if that's known, should probably find the client and put the client's name in here because that's knowable. Um, yeah. The next item is claim your own intellectual property rights for this. Boom. Your name, of course, because Wentworth retains intellectual property rights over everything you submit. Sorry. Um, but that's the legal arrangement. And then you protect your rights uh, by saying, according to the Creative Commons arrangements, uh, any use of this intellectual property requires, legally requires anyone using this property, this intellectual property, to note who the creator is. I'm complying with that by giving you the name of the student who created this work. And forevermore, any use of this image or this text is obligated by legal requirements of the Creative Commons uh, to say who it's who did it. You can also say you can't use it for commercial gain. That's NC, non-commercial. You can also say share alike. Any further sharing has to be with the same arrangements, SA. You can also uh, say, ex use the old fashioned rights reserved, all rights reserved. Then you use the copyright symbol. 
it's very complex. This is what we recommend you protect your legs. This is a habit that you get into as you move through your careers. Next, and this is what connects to the last topic. Next, you, you get the image source. What format do we use to give the image source? Chicago Manual of Style. But within Chicago Manual of Style, you have two very separate things. You have the bibliography style, and you have the note citation style. Which one do you use for the image source? You use the note citation style. If you're not really paying attention to the words that are coming out of my mouth or what I'm showing, just snap to attention for a moment and make mental note. If there's lots of periods in here, it's wrong, you're gonna lose points. If your friends are not hearing this message, please remind them later when you're struggling together through this assignment. Friends don't let friends use the bibliography format with lots of periods between each thing. You use commas. In this whole thing from start to finish, let's count the periods, comma, 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 comma. There's some periods in the URL, period. How many periods? There's one at the very end, like a sentence. The whole caption is like a sentence. It's a block of text that behaves like a sentence. There's a period at the end, and there are a few more periods in the URL. But other than that, it's all commas all the time. So that's the easy way to remember, use note citation format. Even if you never look at this document ever in your whole life, some of you never will. Some of you never have turned to page three. Some of you never will turn to page three. Even if you never do turn to page three, just put commas in it and put a period at the end and we're all good, okay? And you're in this together, so help each other do that. It's also, um, there's also this, a guide to the paragraph. If you, Look at this and study it now that you're deep into this process. Uh, it'll come much easier and you'll just do it out of habit for the rest of your careers, which is the goal. Okay. Those are the common mistakes. Is the most single most common mistake and the reason the most points are lost every week is the simplest task which is just always use the note citation format in the analysis, easy. If you scored one out of four on the evidence argument, it's because you're not following the instructions of the evidence argument. The purpose of the analysis paragraph is to take what you discover, it's to take every point of discovery in the image and convert it into a sentence that goes something like this. Outside of the public library entrance, a generous setback is given back to the streetscape. So that's a description of the architecture. Now, that's the first half of each sentence. The second half of the sentence needs to be, what's the impact? What does this design feature or relationship? What does this design move achieve for the user experience? It indicates a new social circulation space for the public, boom. If you're doing that with every aspect of the image and translating it in every sentence, you are doing analysis. Congratulations, welcome to the discipline of architecture. That's what analysis is. Gone are the days when you're okay doing precedent studies. Here's a picture 
of this building that's my precedent isn't a pretty that's might have been okay in freshman year or sophomore year it's not okay anymore we need you to take it apart piece by piece saying this thing by doing this is achieving this outcome that's analysis it's an interpretive it's an interpretive deep dive into the architecture when you stack up a logical sequence of, of five sentences now you're ready to hit us with a bold claim. The bold claim, we know it's doing its job when it's tying together these different aspects, these different architectural moves and their impacts. It's pulling to them together and it's basically telling the story. This as a whole piece of architecture and urbanism, it's greater than the sum of its parts. These Each of these elements on their own do these things, but taken together, putting them all together, integrating them in a piece of a holistic piece of architecture in this context achieves so much more than each of those moves individually. That's what we want you to see in these examples. It's what we want you to do as architects. That's what good architecture is. That's what good architects do. Welcome to the secret for identifying, understanding, and producing good architecture. Questions? Again, what we would love to see happen, and we know it's going to happen, uh, it's just a matter of how soon does it happen. What we know is going to happen is you're going to get good at this. Almost every single one of you is going to master these skills, and we won't have to talk about it anymore. And instead, we can go straight to the heart of the matter and really stay focused on what are the challenges we're, we anticipate in our careers moving forward, and what can we do to prepare to meet those challenges with imagination, creativity, and success? And the greatest indication of how to do that lies in a deeper understanding of how we got here and what is it going to take to remedy these situations? Questions? Comments? So this week's topic, in a way, this is one of the hardest topics of the course and one of the hardest topics of architecture, which is the legacy of race segregation in the United States. It's something uh, architects have been called upon to turn our attention to. And it brings our attention to uh, questions uh, of structure and agency. Narmina asked a question that after class on Tuesday that um, would be a great uh, spectrum exercise where at this point I'd say, okay, everybody stand up. Which do you think is true? Um, I am in control of what happens to me in my life. I have agency. Or over here, structure. I am caught in this gerbil wheel of social forces and economic forces, and I'm kind of stuck, and there's really nothing any of us can do to change outcomes. Right? So we're not going to stand up and do this, but let's have everyone. Raise their hand. How many of you are over here? I'm in control of my of my fate. Things will go the way they go because I act and behave certain ways. How many of you are more over here? Uh, 
society, we're kind of locked into the structures of society. And there's really not much we can do to change anything. The system is the system. And we call it the system because it controls everything. Okay, now who wants to say something about this? What's wrong with this spectrum? Yeah. I don't think either one or the other, but I, it is, I think it's definitely a good construction because hard to tell much long lasting effect of like beliefs. And of course, there are these like rags to riches stories. But those are usually anomalies. You can't really face the overarching. So, do you have a response to this? Anyone? Ryan, you are you more of an agency guy, right? I wasn't. Oh, anyone have a response? This is honest. Yeah, kind of. yeah, I think it's there's definitely a lot of like true to that statement, but there also is a level of agency where they like you just don't put in the effort to try to get like to climb, I guess. It's obviously not never gonna happen. But you're also I don't think you're like locked locked into that position either. But there's there's like outside forces that you can control. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see a fundamental disagreement. So if we had the bandwidth to work through this in small circles and then we come we report out, and we could do this whole thing. It's predictable what would happen. You say, well, there are structures, that is a thing. There are systemic structural forces. But within those forces, we do have the space to make choices. We do have decision space. And that's a term uh, I'd like us to use. What is the decision space of different actors in the production of architecture, in the use of architecture? And who designs those decision spaces? If we think about decision spaces, can we design decision spaces that improve agency for some uh, actors? And isn't that a useful way to understand our prime example uh, in Medellin, Colombia? Because it's not a useful way. The, you know, the occupants of the Santo Domingo neighborhood where the King of Spain Library Park lived, they were so locked. They were so locked that the only decision they could make is, do I risk sending my daughter to school today? Or do I keep her hidden under the bed? where she could still be hit with a stray bullet, but it's less likely if she's under bed. But if she doesn't go to school, how is she gonna get an education? But if she gets kidnapped or killed on the way to school, how is she gonna have, get a, what's the point of a good education? So that's the decision space of the occupants of Santa Domingo. When the King of Spain Library Park gets designed and built, their decision space, boom, explodes and gets bigger. And all of a sudden, they have the basic security that it takes to actually make healthy choices about whether to go to school or not, whether to, you know, all the decisions open up. And once you have a Metro Kabale gondola taking you down into the city, you have options. You can get a job downtown, you can go to church, you can go to school, you can visit your friends. Uh, it's a way architecture, the, the big thing about structure and agency is we're the ones who are designing structures. You even take a class called structures. It's not a coincidence that these two words are the same. So let's look at our own, as in your own structures. This is another life coaching moment. How much money are you going to make when you graduate? <clears throat> Not enough. Not enough. Yet more than any graduating class of architecture students has ever earned historically, just for inflation. 
Well, if they're true, you're not going to have enough money, but you've never had more. How much more money do you make if you go to the graduate program? $600 a month, a week? A year. $600 a year more? How much does it cost to get a graduate? $50,000. If all you care about is return on investment, do you get a graduate degree? No. No. But no. we have to because one of us is not accredited for a five-year bachelor. No one is. You have to if. Why do you need an accredited degree? Get you get licensed. How important is getting licensed? Not to ask you. <laughs> That's the question. Good luck. <laughs> if money isn't the if if your salary doesn't increase so much after going through another year, and how much money? What's the list price? The list price is seventy thousand dollars, but the actual cost may vary. But the average actual cost is more like forty thousand dollars a year. No, so, right. for tuition alone. Tuition alone. Yeah. So tens of thousands of dollars, 40, somewhere between 40 and $70,000 in order to earn an extra $600 a year. So the reason to get a graduate degree is not a return on investment decision. What's the best reason to go to the graduate program? Get your license uh, because it feels good to get your license. Okay, we'll leave it at that. I, I like to think that because, man, what we do in the graduate program rocks. Talk to someone who's in the graduate program and ask them what's, what's good and what's bad about the graduate program. Okay, so now let's move over here. Well, I can't really see it. Wentworth is ranked 123rd on return on investment. Uh, so, so we asked the question before, how much house, what, what kind of house are you gonna be able to live in? Because we're talking about housing, right? Yes. Um, it's around 60,000 now, so 40,000 is the chain of the So tuition is 40,000. Uh, in Wentworth's website, it says room and board is around $17,000. 17? Okay. Why is, why is Wentworth's room and board 17000 Why is no, it so I high? We don't get that much. Why is it so high? Why does Wentworth charge so much for its housing? It's, it's like the... It's it's charges Wentworth charges the market rate. Why does Wentworth charge the market rate for housing and not what it's cost? The because they can. Do they charge more than the market? Yeah. Yeah. So they have a bit of a but captive it's like, market. It's like honestly an even trade off. Like I would say that it's like we're here for like four months or whatever, mm -hmm. and if you divide it for like six months, it's like the same because we include like. Washer dryer in five feet five and uh, yeah, internet. You're paying for internet already. It's already furnished. Okay. Uh, and stuff like living off campus. I think it's six thousand dollars. Well, this is the decision space. Thank you very much. You've just demonstrated that you guys are navigating the decision space. Do I go to graduate school? Do I not go to graduate school? Do I live on campus? Do I live off campus? Here are the costs, here are the benefits, and here's, here's the outcomes, the likely outcomes, right? So this is the decision space in action. And, and since we're talking about housing costs, this ties in with everything we've been talking about all semester. Wentworth charges $17,000 for room and board on campus because it can because that's what it decided it can get away with without losing its students 
And when we had a pandemic, I don't know if you know this, but there was a pandemic and we had class off campus, Wentworth panicked and said, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't care if people get infected. We need to fill those dorms. That's how everybody have class on campus. You have to. You're obligated to have class on campus because we got to fill those dorms because we're going to go bankrupt if we don't. Can I um, add one more thing? That's only for two semesters. Right. It doesn't include like the summer. Semester. Right. So, what if, how many people have student loans? That, how, who has student loans? Jen and Anna, you don't have student loans? Yeah, everyone has student loans because it's a good deal. And we, everyone has the federal student loans, right? We love those federal student loans. Why? Why do we love those federal student loans? <laughs> because it's subsidized by the US government. Thank you very much. Uh, New Deal back in the 19, while well, Sputnik, when we were trying to compete with the Soviet Union, we boost, the US government decided strategically it needed to boost its college education system so it established the federal student loan program. It's subsidized. And what's gonna to happen to your federal student loans? What's happening to your federal student loans? Talk to your parents. They're the ones tracking this. What's happening? They're possibly forgiven. They're gonna be forgiven. Possibly. If you die, they're forgiven. But even if you don't die, there's a program working its way through the machinery that says, hey, college students, your federal student loans, you owe us typically on average $26,000 when you graduate from a four-year program. That's not that much actually anymore. Um, we'll just get rid of that. Just don't pay us back. You keep that. That's what's about to happen. So we love, we loved federally subsidized student loans before, and we're about to love them a whole lot more, right? But what's this? How many people have loans outside of the, the student, federal student loan program? This is the average for students who have, at Wentworth, for students who have other loans beyond the federal student loan program. This is the average. So you're gonna graduate those, so you know, a lot of your colleagues are graduating from four or five years, let's say five years, uh, because about half of you decide to go to the graduate program. Uh, you graduate with $80,000 in debt. But your return on investment over the lifetime of your career is millions and millions of dollars. So over your lifetime earnings, on average, individual performance may vary, excellent deal and that's how your parents justify it and you'll learn to come around to that even though this number seems really unreal when you're saying to your studio professor i would have printed out the plan but it costs like a dollar <laughs> who's got the money for that right okay so what is how are you going to repay these student loans this is all about your real estate. This is your decision space in the next 10 years. What kind of house are you going to live in? How do your student loan repayments impact the house you're going to live in? So let's move through it quickly. Save this, save the link to this slide deck and come back to it when you and your life partner uh, in 10 years or so are deciding what to do career-wise and when you are ready to purchase real estate. Are you, are, who's gonna own their own house at some point? Hopefully. Who's not gonna own their own home at some point? Okay, uh, if you're not paying attention at all to what I'm saying, don't raise your hand. Right, you have to kind of focus. Okay, just checking. All right. So how much, how much, what are your loan payments every month? How much? When you graduate, 
how much your loan payments can be every month. Here's a hint. Thank you. That is that a lot? <laughs> okay. Let's say you're like a typical American and the person and I hate to be so cisnormative here, but a lot of people uh, partner up and they have life partners. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Statistically, that's what happens. You have life partners and statistically, you tend not to partner with someone who is that different from you socioeconomically. So let's assume you're making, let's go five, 10 years out. How much are you making now as a licensed architect? Probably still that average. $52,000 a year? So it's, so it's 2030. Everyone travel forward in time. It's 2030. So the economy is still going well. Right. Five years after you graduate, how much are you making? On average, statistically, individual performance may vary. 60. 60? $60,000 a year? Maybe 70. Good luck. <laughs> Financial services is right over there in Wall Street. 70, let's say $70,000 a year. Not bad. Historically, unprecedented. Sounds like not enough, right? But that's what statistically, currently, that's what I think, my best guess. And let's say you, you marry someone who also makes about that, or you partner with someone who also makes that. So you have a household income of $140,000 a year. Gone are the days when you have one income families. Sorry, sorry about that. The system has shifted, the structure has shifted. The assumption is two full careers. Good luck having kids. Okay, so um, how much, what, how, what are your loan payments every month for the two of you? $1,600 a month. How much of a house can you afford? $460,000. What kind of a house does that buy you? Massive. Massive one in Texas. This is an amazing tool that you will want to look up five, 10 years from now when you're looking for housing. Mm -hmm. The red are places that you can't afford to live in. The yellow are places you cannot afford to live in. The green, that's where the median family, uh, when, this is 2016 data. The housing market has, what's happened since the pandemic? <sighs> housing costs have shot up, totally disconnected. It's like they have a mind of their own. They don't care if no one can buy their houses we're not gonna come down in price, it just ratchets up. Plus what happened to mortgage rates, uh, the interest rate for a mortgage. Sorry, kids, good luck purchasing real estate in this climate. No one's doing it. There are no sales right now. So here's more or less the situation. Let's see, you can't really tell, but the places that you can afford between the median house cost and the $460,000 that you can afford. It's the very light colored areas of Milton, Dorchester, um, East Boston, and Lynn. Good luck. So let's go back to the drawing board. And you know how we were paying off our student loans in 10 years? Oh, it's such a good deal interest-wise. I think we should go for the 30-year plan. So pay off your student loan. This is the first move that someone's gonna advise you to do. Instead of paying off your loans in 10 years, switch to refinance. Hopefully it's, it's a lower interest rate than this when you do this. 
and uh, you borrow an eighty thousand, you'll uh, spend one hundred and fifty thousand paying that back over the course of thirty years. Over the course of thirty years, you end up paying much, much more because most of it goes to interest. Um, than 10 years, but it's worth it because of the time cost of money. And instead of $460,000 house value, you get to, you've earned the right to spend $560,000 for a house. The map changes slightly, we think. So you can't really tell the difference between the deep yellow and the light yellow, but the light yellow is the place where you can now look. It's gotten a little bit more open to you. But the story is uh, that what you will experience is, is the slogan, the drive to the equality. And this connects with the next topic next week, which is uh, the automobile dependency of the United States and increasingly the rest of the world. In order to get a backyard, in order to get a school system, I don't know how many of you are going to have kids. Again, this is normative thing. Um, so, if you're going to have kids, where are you going to live? Right. The United States is the only country in the world that funds its school systems based on local property taxes. This is going to come into play when we get into the deep, deeper topic of this lecture today. And here's the other thing. In order to purchase a $460,000 house, you need 10% of that as a down payment, unless you qualify for special first-time homeowner uh, subsidies. $46,000, you just need to come up with that in cash. It's not part of your loan. And for this house, you need $56,000 in cash. How do you save up for a down payment when between graduation and home purchase, you're paying Boston rents and trying to spend as little time as you can in the car getting to and from your job. Maybe you can get a job that's out further in Framingham, but guess what? Those jobs don't pay $70,000 a year. Those jobs pay $55,000 a year. So there's a whole nother decision space another variable thrown into your decision space, right? So uh, you're gonna end up spending a lot of time in your cars going to and from work. Hopefully this Zoom thing will catch on and you'll only have to come in two or three days a week, but that's the shape of our, our industry right now. Questions about that? Are, are you depressed? It's best that you know now um, and enjoy life, right? How do people do it? Some people do save, they, they rent a, a lousy apartment or they get lucky. They find a very inexpensive apartment in Alston, Brighton. But that is about to go away because of Harvard's expansion. So the more, the more things move, the further out you're going to end up being. So the the, the answer historically has been uh, just inherit some wealth, have family wealth. So this is the foundation for what we're about to talk about. Like whenever we've taught this before, we'd say after World War II, the soldiers returning from home were offered GI loans to go to college very cheaply. They were offered um, mortgage finance that they had just, the Homeowners Loan Association had just invented subsidized home ownership mortgages. And you basically could not afford to stay in apartments, renting apartments in the city. It's actually cheaper to purchase homes in the suburbs where the schools are better and there's a freeway that they're building between the city and the suburbs. So you can. Uh, commute easily and quickly to your office in the city. We used to teach that way, but we had to increasingly 
at the end of every statement that we make, we have to add the words, if you're white, you could go to college paid for by the GI loan if you're white. You can afford a house in the suburbs if you're white. You can buy all these things if you're white. You can go to these schools if you're white. And it's really awkward to be teaching the history of cities in that way. So even before we get into the history of racial segregation in real estate and housing in the built environment, uh, the larger we're still talking about this larger structure that is making it daunting, a bit intimidating for everyone, white, non-white, whatever, everyone's ability to move up in the uh, social economic system hierarchy is changing. Do you understand what's being shown here? So if you were born in the 1940s, 95% of the people born in 1940 ended up significantly out earning their parents, 95%. When your parents were born, when were your parents born? 60s and 70s. So when your parents were born, that changed. If they started out in the lower income, if they started out in a lower income family, they had a good chance, almost just as good. They had a good chance of earning more than their parents. If they were born, if they were earning slightly, if their parents were in this middle class, what we used to call the middle class, then they had a 60 to 65% chance of earning more than their parents. If they were born into uh, the, the wealthiest families, the chances of earning as much or more than their parents goes down, understanding that some included. This is about income, not wealth. There's a difference. Now, we don't have the data for your generation. When we ask your generation, and so let's do that. How many of you are going to earn more than your parents? Your generation is one of the most optimistic generations ever. You all believe that you're going to earn more than your parents, statistically. But the, the data suggests that never before in recent history, have you been less likely to earn as much as your parents? Kyle. Is this thinking of it like each parent individually or like their combined income? Um, it's, it's more in terms of households. The data aggregates from tax forms as households. So your household wealth uh, that you were born into and your household wealth that you achieved. And here's the weird thing. This is, in a way, the punchline. So if you're trying to do other things, this would be a good time to look up. Um, the percent of change in real income from after World War II up to around uh, the 1970, uh, the productivity of the economy, everybody just got better because of technology changes and workplace practices. Everybody started to earn more and more as uh, the economy became more and more productive. Then starting around 1970, there was a disconnect. And all of a sudden, the productivity kept going up. We had machines, and then we had computers, and then we had systems organization, and efficiencies just piled on top of each other, and our ability to produce goods and services and bads and disservices. Uh, got more and more efficient and more, uh, more profitable, more money came out than we were putting in, and that just kept going. But from this point on, the wealthiest 10% income earners, they're the ones who got that increase in, in productivity and efficiency. The, the, everybody else, the other 90%, their wages, their income stopped growing, more or less. It just 
It's right, right in the same place the whole time for 53 years. That's a long time to stop gaining income. So if there's inflation, that's because wages are going up now, right? Salaries are going up. Is that why, why else would there be inflation? Salaries are going up, right? It's like something more expensive to make. Well, the cost of making things is going up or down? Um, I would say it's maybe going up because of like lack of resources or global events, but companies want to keep the same profit, so they would raise the price. You think, but not yet. Because of the way the system operates, go ahead. Well, historically, isn't the cost of production super low? The cost of production keeps going down. The availability of resources keeps getting cheaper for some reason. We live in a world where the rules are set that whoever extracts the most and dumps the most into the air gets the most money. And the cost of extracting and the cost of dumping keeps going down. You would think it would go up, but it just keeps going down. For a moment, the pandemic caused supply chain disruption and then the spike in demand for especially home improvements during the pandemic caused a scarcity that caused a temporary rise in costs. But we're over that. We're back. We're back to full supply chain normalcy. And yet the prices keep going up. It's not wages, it's not resources, it's not the cost of transportation, it's not the cost of oil. It's that the story being told in the news is that there's inflation. And once you have a story in the news that there's inflation, you know, the Ukrainian war, the pandemic, corporations, because they have a, a major share of the market, they are wink, wink, nod, nod. We can keep our profits going up and up. Never before have the profits been so high than in the last three years. And so this is still happening where the percentage share, and that's why we get to uh, the graph that we had last week, last Tuesday, actually, where instead of what some of you want, instead of what some of you think is the case, instead of what it was historically between 1945 and 1970, where you actually had a majority of the United States doing much, much better than their parents. This was something we called the middle class. How many of you are from families who are members of the middle class? Culturally, it, that includes everybody. Certainly everybody at one level. To someone who's not a member, whose household is not a member of the middle class? Here's the thing. Between 1945 and 1970, there was a thing that you could call the middle. It was a majority of Americans, if you like, and you could, you all of a sudden you had discretionary income. You got your paycheck, you could put some of it away. You could take care of housing, health, transportation, food, all of this, you could take care of all these things, and then you had extra money. You could save it, you could go on vacations, you could buy a car that you actually didn't need. You had all these discretionary choices in your decision space because of what you, what you earned. That was the middle class. But since 1970, we've moved from that kind of a curve to the curve that we saw Without too much exaggeration, this is the curve that we now have. If there is a middle class, 
you would have to say that's that's the group with discretionary income. And it's not the middle. It's not the, the median. You can take 50 out of 100 US citizens uh, and you say that's what the median is. The median is, is here in terms of numbers of people and they're living paycheck to paycheck. Who else is living paycheck to paycheck? Everybody is living. A vast majority of the middle is living paycheck to paycheck. They're, they're not putting money into savings. They're not saving up for that down payment. And they're not, uh, they don't have, they can't leave their jobs because they'll lose their health care. And then they're one uh, slip and fall away from absolute bankruptcy. So your parents have to stay in their jobs until you're graduating. So all of these things, we, we still use the word term middle class, but there is no more middle class. There's nothing middle about it. I encourage a lot of us in academia now refer to the consumer class. And this is another example of what we learned looking at China and Indonesia and India. This is the way it's been there for a long time. Why do companies want access to Chinese markets? Because the wealthiest 5% of Chinese have a lot of discretionary income. And there are 1.5 billion Chinese. So 5% of 1.5 billion is a lot of consumers. It's like a small, it's like France, uh, if everyone had discretionary in income. It's a lot of consumers. Increasingly, U.S. companies are staying afloat by catering only to the wealthiest consumers because they're the ones with discretionary income. That's why when you go into the mall, there are luxury brands that seem to be doing fine. They, don't have, they only have to sell one or two things a day because it's so expensive. That's how housing is moving. This is where housing is moving to, that the housing market is distorted by these luxury investment purchases um, that is increasing the costs of the general market for everyone. So despite the fact that it's getting harder and harder to rise up, income mobility is more and more difficult, the stories of lifting yourself up by your bootstraps become more and more potent and familiar and popular. The original term, lift you up by your bootstraps, was actually kind of a joke. Because have you ever tried to lift yourself up by pulling on your shoe? You could try this at home. Don't get hurt. Make sure there's something nearby. But it's really hard. Some would say it's impossible to lift oneself up by pulling on your shoes. That was what lifting yourself up by your bootstraps used to mean. But now we use it as just work hard and everyone, if you work hard, you will succeed. This is Robert Reich. My name is Robert Reich. I was Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. So I'm using a lot of film today because they just do a better job. 1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. Last year, we made 36,000. I'd probably make 50,000 a year working 70 hours a week. The middle class is struggling. The people occasionally say to me, what nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boom, but you had very low inequality. You know, Robert Rice, I do. He's a communist. When I was a kid, bigger boys would pick up.
Don't go away. Where's the sound? You have your computer audio on the shelf, right? Because there's sound right here as well. It's they only take four students per class. Share screen. My name is Robert Reich. I'm the Secretary of Labor of Bill Clinton. Before that, the Carter administration. Before that, I was a special aide to Abraham Lincoln. Of all developed nations, the United States has the most unequal distribution of income, more stringent or even greater than the public. 1928 and 2007 become the peak years for income concentration. It looks like a suspension bridge. Last year, we made 36,000. Working seven hours a week. The middle class is struggling. When people occasionally say to me, What nation does it better? The answer is the United States. In the decades after World War II, the economy boomed, but you had very low inequality. You know, Robert Wright, I do agree. He's a communist. I was a kid. I think it changed my life. I had to protect people from the people who would keep them up economically. Who is actually looking out? The American worker. The answer is nobody. They don't have power. They don't have a voice. They're working. So you get the idea that um, in terms of income inequality, things are shifting uh, in terms of what we should do about it. Uh, increasingly, the answer is architecture. And that is also uh, true for the main topic of this week, which is how does race play into the provision of goods and services in cities? Uh, and what are we gonna need to do about it during your careers? And uh, it turns out, and this is, there's recent research uh, by two professors coming out of Harvard. One of them is Raj Chetty. And he uh, recently published these findings that show that some places have much higher economic mobility than the United States. So it turns out the American dream is doing fine, just not in the United States, but other places is doing it better. Uh, this graph shows the share of children making more money than their parents. Uh, it keeps going down and down and down uh, in the United States. Uh, it turns out that the opportunities to move economically up the ladder is geographic, it is spatial, that some places are geared up to have a high degree of economic mobility those areas are shown in white, and other areas are geared to pretty much guarantee that you're not gonna move up economically, shown in red. So these are, the red areas are places where you're just not going to go up. The places in the lighter colors are places where you're more likely, especially if your family moves there. So what prevents families from moving to place to place? 
money. Some places are much more expensive than others. But what Raj Chetty has done in his work is he's identified places where you can actually afford to move and your children are more likely uh, to have a better chance. And the most significant way to make that available to the lowest income earners, households, is through a system of housing vouchers that the United States uses to make housing more affordable for those uh, who would normally not be able to afford it. Unfortunately, support for the housing voucher program has been declining over the years and the waiting list for housing vouchers is eight, 10 years long uh, in many places, including Boston. So in that scenario, we look at, this is still, we're talking about things are tough all over for everyone, but there are ways you can make decisions within that decision space. There are things you can do to make it more likely of positive outcomes. But uh, those decision spaces are not equally distributed. It turns out that if you are a black or brown family in the United States, those things are just not available in the same way. And that's the challenge for architects. And so we look at Los Angeles, uh, architects have always looked at Los Angeles as an exception. When we used to teach this class, all we cared about was Paris, London, New York, Chicago, these cities that follow the rules that we are familiar to us for hundreds of years. And those rules, and in that context, California was the bizarre exception. No, it was the only place that acted like it, like Los Angeles acts, um, but that has switched. Los Angeles, instead of being a place like Chicago, where there's an economic center, or Boston, where there's a port and a downtown, and that's where the money changed hands, and the wealthy people live as close as you can to that core because no one wants to spend more than a half hour getting to work. How many people spent 10 minutes or less coming to class today? Okay, how many people spent 10 to 30 minutes coming to class today? And how many people spent 30 to 50 minutes coming to class today? How many people spent more than 50 minutes coming to class today? Okay, so historically, even in ancient Rome, the the amount of time we spent getting to where we needed to go typically was 30 minutes each way. That's just, that's one of the few things that doesn't change, except now in the United States. Instead of being the single core that people locate themselves in relation to that core, Los Angeles is what we call a polynucleic city. It has multiple centers and it's separated by a network of freeways. How many people have spent significant time in LA? Or how many people have been to Los Angeles? What's it like? Crowded. Crowded. Crowded with people? People, buildings, cars. Cars. <clears throat> so this is the classical model of cities. It has a port at the center. It's, and this is kind of the Chicago model. Uh, the highest values at the center, the values go down as you move out. And that's kind of true of Boston. Um, but what we've noticed is some things can disrupt that pattern. Like in Chicago, this is Lake Michigan. There is no place to live here. And so it shifts all the things here. And then there are corridors established by Road, roads and railways and canals and industrial uh, infrastructures. And that's what there is an industrial infrastructure line here to, to connect Chicago to the rest of the country. So where the industrial infrastructure is located, that's where the black and brown residents of Chicago uh, have accumulated, not because of preference, but because 
because of, as we know now from uh, Richard Rothstein, as a matter of legal requirements because of the banking system. We now have very sophisticated computational modeling that continues to reveal things that we had not previously understood. And it's not just architects doing this now, it's geographers and economists and historians and humanities professors. This is called the digital humanities. It's the spatial turn Every discipline is now using the tools of architecture to figure out and make sense of what's going on in the world. You next year will be learning uh, GIS. How many of you have used GIS? Okay. I think all of you will be learning GIS. So these different forces that disrupt the neat and tidy concentric circles uh, develops more into a sector model of cities. And increasingly, Los Angeles has become the model for every city. So even Boston has developed a kind of a Los Angeles polynucleics, multiple centers arrangement. And especially cities like Jakarta, and Bangkok and other cities around the world, these booming cities are all following the model of Los Angeles. So from becoming an exception, Los Angeles has become the new normal. These computational models allow us to look at the racial and ethnic uh, spaces of the city. This is Los Angeles. Red is white, blue is black, African American, uh, green is Asian, and yellow is Hispanic, and the white is the mountains. And so, even after the civil rights movement of the 60s, when housing discrimination was, was made illegal, the concentration according to race has, if anything, increased. What's up with that? Why does that do that? We know prior to the 1960s, we know why. And we know it because we read Richard Rothstein. These, when the, when the US government established the Home Ownership uh, Federal Subsidized Loan Association program, it needed to make sure, this is rational to a certain extent, needed to make sure that the, the money that was being loaned for homeownership would not lose its value. And the way they defined lose value is racially. A neighborhood was deemed to be a place that would lose value if non-white families moved in. And so green not, is white, blue, uh, Green was considered working class, blue, I mean, white collar businessmen. Blue was uh, white collar, uh, less affluent, and red was hazardous. And any zone that had industrial production or uh, non-white families were zoned as red. And uh, there are a series of movies that I'm gonna share on WhatsApp that um, we don't have time to um, show here uh, in their completeness, but the rough outline of this is that after the Civil War, uh, there was something called reparations and reconstruction. So in 19, 1865, when the Civil War ended and the slaves were freed, the US Army also had all these white plantations. And the US government said, we're gonna subdivide these plantations into 40 acre plots. And the slaves that once worked these fields will now own those 40 acre plots. And those 40 acre plots were transferred, the deed and titles to those 40 acre plots was transferred to the free enslaved workers. And that was the beginning of reparations. In 1977, uh, 
because of a contested election. In 1977, they pushed pause on reparations. They pushed pause on reparations uh, because there was a contested election and the South made a deal with uh, the North. And the deal was, listen, if you remove the U US troops who are enforcing uh, these laws of redistributing land to the formerly enslaved populations, uh, just remove the, the, the military from the South, you can trust us. We'll take care of things to make sure no one's human rights are violated. Uh, we'll let you have the presidency. So that deal was struck in 1877. The South broke its rule, broke its vow. It took away the 40 acres that it had granted. And uh, we restored the system of uh, chattel employment for the next 130 years during, under the laws of Jim Crow and redlining. And so the punchline is that and this is what's gonna be covered in the film that I want you to watch that I'm gonna share, is that now fast forward to the present, wealth, that wealth that allows you to make that down payment, the family wealth, where did that family wealth come from? It came from the housing that your parents and grandparents purchased after World War II. The value of that housing went up and up and up, and that wealth is what allows uh, the children of those families to go to college. It allows those children of those families to make down payments when they, it's time for them to buy real estate. For every, uh, the typical wealth of a white family now is something like $150,000. In the same areas, the typical family of a black family a uh, typical wealth of a black family is 10% of that. So $15,000. Why? That's the topic of the film that I want you to watch as we move into the analysis and the discussion for Tuesday. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone.